the Orthodox Church in America. Archbishop Paul was baptized Paul in honor of the Apostle St. Paul, and then grew up in Detroit and graduated from Wayne State University in 1976, where he studied history and psychology. And after graduating, he worked with emotionally and physically abused children and continued his education, receiving a master's in social work. In 1991, he began his theological education at St. Vladimir's Seminary, where he graduated as valedictorian in 1994 with a master's in divinity. He was then ordained to the priesthood that summer and began to serve St. Thomas the Apostle Church in Kokomo, Indiana. In 2007, he began to serve as the dean of the St. George Cathedral in Rossford, Ohio. Then in 2014, Father Paul was tonsured a monk and given the name Paul, this time in honor of St. Paul the Confessor, Patriarch of Constantinople. He was subsequently elected as Bishop of Chicago in the Midwest by the Holy Synod of the Orthodox Church of America, and he was ordained to the Episcopacy on December 27, 2014, making today the seventh anniversary of his ordination to the Episcopacy. On May 20th, 2020, he was elevated to the rank of Archbishop. You have to look forward to your words this week, but before we do, in honor of your anniversary, I'd like to ask everybody to please rise. Citing scriptures that relate to the Transfiguration, and I will offer a few comments here and there. In my other two talks, I will address a second question posed to me: How is the Transfiguration an experience we can take? We can take part. In my third talk, I will address the question: How can we apply Peter's desire to remain on the mountain to our experience at this college conference? Since this is work, this, since, since this is a four-day conference, we can stay. But how can we then take the light of transfiguration back to our lives on campus? Um, well, let's get back to Matthew 17, which I just quoted. It does seem pretty straightforward. Jesus goes up to a mountain where he is transfigured before Peter, James, and John. His face shines bright like the sun, and his garments become white as light. Then Moses and Elijah enter the picture and begin to converse with Jesus. No big deal, just an everyday experience, right? There's a lot more going on here. Just to quote something from our small Vesper service of the feast, we sing, come let us rejoice, mounting up from the earth to the highest contemplation of the virtues. Let us be transformed to stay in a better state and direct our minds to heavenly things. Being shaped anew in piety according to the form of Christ, for in his mercy, the Savior of our souls has transfigured man and made him shine with the light from Mount Tabor. There's some really important words here. The highest contemplation of the virtues that tells us something about the transfiguration. It's being transfigured into a better state. What is that state like? And direct our minds to heavenly things. 
being shaped anew in piety according to the form of Christ. From this verse, we can learn the following. We are being shaped anew in piety according to the form of Christ. What is that form? What, what do you think of? We think about the form of Christ. What is that form? We are being transformed to stay into a better state. We leave the earth moving towards the highest contemplation of the virtues. That's another clue. That, you know, that, that to be on Mount Tabor is to be transformed in virtue. The, the transfiguration is not a head game we play of intellectual reflection. It's not a matter of how many books we have read on. The transfiguration is a lived experience. It is about living a virtuous life. It is a work of grace where we take an active step of faith to ascend Mount Tabor and allow the Lord to shine the energy of his uncreated light upon us. This is how being shaped anew, this is, this is how being shaped anew in piety, according, this is, this is how, how we are being shaped anew in, the, in piety according to the form of Christ. It is a work of grace, but it is a work nonetheless. And I will expand on this in my other two talks. But being shaped anew in the form of Christ, it's to allow this process of letting, allowing this transfigured life, this, to partake in the energy of, of his uncreated life that we often hear about from Father Gregory Pablo Moss. Um, another comment I wish to make is a person who is Jesus is revealed. His divine glory was already in him, his hidden divinity, his hidden divinity. And Jesus only revealed to his disciples what was already there. So we hear from St. John of Damascus. He was transfigured, not, not, a, not taking on what he was not, but making what he was visible to his own disciples, opening their eyes and enabling them who had been blind to see. This is what that phrase means. He was transfigured before their faces. He remained exactly the same as he was, but he appeared in a way beyond the way he had appeared before. And in that appearance seemed different to his disciples. Again, this is an important thing for us to remember. Um, the transfiguration is not hocus pocus. It's not magic. It's not like now, now you're God like now you're not. Our Lord was fully God and fully human, which I'll mention later. And everything that he was, fully man and fully human and fully God was in him already. The disciples just didn't get to see it. And now they got a chance where it was revealed, his divinity was revealed to, to them in a way that uh, other were, others were not allowed to see. But there was no magic here. Jesus was only showing who he really was to them. And then when we begin to look at ourselves, we begin to see then that we're created in the image and likeness of God. And so there's something of this divine spark that's in us already. And I think the whole purpose of Christian formation is to bring that part of us out, that God would, that we would allow God to, to do His work in us, to allow this person of His Son, this divine spark that's in us, to emerge from our lives. Because a lot of times it's it's kind of we've heard this analogy, you know, you see coals that are co covered by ashes. And you have to stir up the coals to reveal the fire, the redness, because the ashes get in the way. And so, in some ways, in the transfiguration, we're being allowed to see something that is meant to be in us already. By the grace of God, we're called, as, as St. Gregory the Theologian says, we're called to become by grace what God is by nature. We're called to become by grace what God is by nature. And that's an important thing for us to remember. Um, and in that sense, we'll talk probably some about the idea of Christian, Christian living involves work. It involves an ascetical task to work at. You know, it just doesn't happen hocus pocus because I say one night I want it to happen. You know, there's a cost involved. If we want to become godlike, if we want to have this divine energy in us, then we need to work on removing those obstacles in our life we find to get in the way of that. And so I wanted to say something very clear. Our Lord's transfiguration was a revelation, not a change. As St. John of Damascus says, in the transfiguration of Lord was not taking on what he was not, but making visible what he was to his own disciples, opening their eyes and enabling them who had been blind to see. 
So when I reflect upon this, I remember when I was hearing what everybody wanted to do, I remember my college years at Wayne State University, Detroit. I was lost for two, three years. I went to church all my life. I was an acolyte. I won acolyte of the year award. And I, I, you know, on the outside, I looked like I was squeaky clean. But man, inside, I didn't know what I was doing. I'd lost sense of why I was here. Where, where was I going? Where was I going? And so, for me, my life was about trying to fulfill my parents' expectations, but now I kind of got to the point in my life, but this is what they gave me. Is this what I believe? Is this what I think? Is this what I know to be true? And so for me, there was a time of like real doubting and exploration and not particularly happy times. I don't know what it's like for you, but I find the first two years of college is being very difficult, especially if you don't know what you want to major in. Either it's about partying or, you know what I mean? It, it's, really, it's really a hard time to go through. And, um, and so God was merciful because at some point I was able to cry out and say, Lord, I don't know what am I doing, what I'm doing, help me. And I had to come to the end of myself. I had to finally say, Lord, this isn't making sense to me. If this is real, if this is, if this is for real, find a way to show me. And um, so... It, it was tough. I mean, I, I, I had been blind. I had to confess my blindness first if I was going to learn anything more. Uh, now, I do want to say that what happened at Mount Tabor is a lot different because in a lot of the, the stories of the Transfiguration, we, you know, um, Moses figures largely in this because he was also transformed in a mountain. Not in the same way, though. It was external. He went up in the, he went into the darkness of the call of the mountain for 40 days to converse with God. He, and in this divine darkness, we call it a divine darkness, he emerged glowing. You know, they had to put a veil over his face because pe people couldn't bear to look at it. But what Moses went through was something different. Something happened to him that wasn't already in him. There was an external reality that came upon him and changed him, but it wasn't in him. It wasn't, it wasn't in his nature to be that way. Whereas in our Lord, when he transfigures himself, he's bringing out what's already in him. So, so Moses goes to Mount Sinai and receives the law. He comes down from his face glowing from his experience of being on the mountain for 40 days because he did converse with God face to face. A veil needed to be put on his face as people could not look at him. This is interesting in that the scriptures say, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. But when Moses asked our Lord to show him his glory, the Lord says to Moses, no man can look on my face and live. So there's a bit of a contradiction there. He, he speaks to God as if he's speaking face to face, but then when Moses asked the Lord to show him his glory, Later on in Exodus, you know, the word tells him nobody can, he's, he's told nobody can look upon his face and live. Then the word goes on to tell Moses, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand upon a rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. I don't understand. That, that, that kind of really blows me away. What's this about? What's going on? Um, I can only say this is an external process again. It did not come from within Moses. It was God coming to Moses himself. But there's also something about this story, this, this account from Exodus, that reminds me of the Incarnation. Because we also see the hint of the Incarnation in this verse from Exodus. Listen to what St. John Damascus has to say on this commentary in Exodus I just quoted from you about Moses being uh, hit, hit under the cleft of a rock and God showing it the backside to him. St. John of Damascus says, Today the abyss of inaccessible light, today the boundless outpouring of divine radiance shines on the apostles on Mount Tabor. Today Jesus Christ, the reality and the name that is clear to me, truly the sweetest and most attractive of names, exceeding all notions of sweetness, is recognized as the Lord of the Old and New Testament. Today, Moses, the leading figure of the Old Covenant, 
the divine lawgiver is presented on Mount Tabor to Christ, who offered the law, offered the laws to his Lord. He gazes on Christ's divine work, which had long been represented in mystical figures. For I would say myself that what that, that was the significance of the back parts of God. And he sees the glory that God had clearly while sheltered in a hole in the rock, the scripture says. But the rock is Christ. God who has become flesh, the word of the Lord, as the divine Paul has expressly instructed us. For the rock, he says, was Christ, quoting Corinthians, who opened a kind of a tiny cave as it were in his own flesh, and from it flooded those in his presence with boundless light, stronger than any powers of this vision. Isn't this a hint of the incarnation, the nativity of the Lord? His body is that tiny cave as it were in his own flesh, and from it flooded those in his presence with boundless light. And who bowed down before him? The shepherds and the wise men, they worshipped him and gave him gifts. You only worship a divine presence. You don't worship man, you worship God. And so obviously th there's a hint of the, these words from Exodus that point to the incarnation of our Lord in this time. That Christ and his, and his person, this cave, they, ga they gaze upon a, a baby, an infant, but they worship him as God. Something of his divine presence is revealed to these people. And they bow down and worship him. And the other thing, I don't know if you heard me when I was quoting this, how many times I said the word today in this quote from Exodus? Today, the abyss of inaccessible light. Today, the boundless outpouring of divine radiance. Today, Jesus Christ, a reality in the name that is dear to me. Today, Moses, the leading figure of the Old Covenant, he goes on and on. We, we were constantly hearing this word today over and over. Um, also notice how many times the word today is, a, is repeated in the citation from St. John of Damascus. The events of the Old Testament are not merely past events. I think one of the things, that, the Old Testament is our book to read. Yeah, because if you try and read it like a history book, it doesn't make any sense. But it's a reflection upon our years of our relationship with God. It's a, his, it's a history of our experience of God working in the midst of this world to make himself known to us. And you have to read it from that perspective, not as a history book. And so I, I would say to you that the Old Testament is not merely something about the past. The church sees the events of the Old Testament as being an active participant in the Lord's transfiguration. These revelations from the Lord, these todays, are times to reveal something beyond our own experience of chronological time. There can be a today for us now. Another time we're going to hear those todays read is when we bless water at the Epiphany. And we're going to go through this long, again, it's based on a homily, but the today, it's said repeatedly, today this happens, today that happens, today this happens. So. We're not looking back in time, but we're taking something eternal and bringing it into the present. And, and it's being made known to us. And we can't do that without the Old Testament as well. We need the old and the new that work together. Uh, I learned a lot more about Mary being a virgin by readings in the Old Testament than I do reading some doctrinal book. So the Old Testament points to a number of mysteries that become fulfilled in Christ when he comes into this world. And I think one of the things you'll notice about the Transfiguration miracle is there's a certain point when all these visions are gone and then the disciples only see Jesus. And then we see in Jesus, he's the fulfillment of both the Old and the New Testaments. And in his presence, we have both the Old and New Covenant present within him, making, it, making himself known to us. What else happens in our Lord's transfiguration? Humanity and divinity are joined together. And this is an important thing. Two natures in one person. Even though Christ shines with his divine light on his disciples, he does not cease to be human. It is interesting that after the Father speaks from the cloud, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. All the revelations vanish and the disciples only see Jesus. The divine energies of our Lord revealed to his disciples the vision of Moses and Elijah, and the voice of the Father seemed to disappear, and only Jesus is seen. Our Lord tells his disciples, who went with him on Mount Tabor, 
not to tell anyone of this vision until he had risen from the dead. When they see only Jesus, it is clear that this event, his transfiguration, is a preview of what is to come. So the Lord's divinity is hidden once again in his humanity as they descend from Mount Tabor. Now, one of the most important hymns we sing in our church is something called the Dogmaticon. And you always find this, if you, if you go to Great Vespers, it's always towards the end of Lord I Call. At the glory now and ever, at the now and ever, this Dogmaticon is sung. And it's a hymn that teaches us about the relationship between the two natures of Christ and his person. These are doctrinal hymns of our faith. It can be found at the Lord I Call, as I said. And here's an example, one of the eight dogmatical hymns of the eight-tone cycle of our church. The King of Heaven, because of his love for man, appeared on earth and dwelt with men. He took flesh from his pure virgin, and after assuming it, he came forth from her. The Son is one in two natures, yet one person, proclaiming him as perfect God and perfect man. We confess Christ our God. Entreat him, O unwedded mother, to have mercy in our souls. So we clearly believe in our church, and this is not an option. You can choose not to believe and be faithful to our teaching. That we confess Christ as being of two natures and one person, perfect God and perfect man. Neither nature gets swallowed up in the other, nor is he 50% God or 50% man. He is 100% God and 100% man. Why is this important? This leads to another comment I offer now. The thesis of the transfiguration reveals that God is by nature that the thesis of the transfiguration reveals that what God is by nature we can become by grace. we can become so by grace. I think the thought is from St. Gregory the Theologian. To further expand on this, we need to talk about the fall of Adam and Eve. The theology of Genesis reflects on their fall as being a desire of Adam and Eve to become God godlike by severing their communion from God and turning to something from this world to seek that end that had no to seek that end that had no life in itself. The only way the first couple could attain a divine and thus fully human life was by their participation in the life of their creator. All that is good proceeded from him, and they exchanged that truth for a lie, seeking that fullness of life in something created. But in God, but in Christ, the doorway is opened up for us to be restored to this reality of our original beauty being, by being created in the image of God and to grow into his likeness. This does matter in that if Christ was just only a human, and even, even the energy that comes from him is created, he would not be able to fulfill his mission to save. That is why we believe our Lord is fully human and fully divine. Because, as I said, if he's just mere human, he's like us. Then how can somebody who's mere human save, save us? He's fully human, yet he has to be more. He has to be something good and wonderful. Because by looking at him, he reveals a spark that's in us. And then I get back to that phrase I said, we are called to, we, 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 we are called to become by grace what God is by nature. So we can become, I'll mention this later, we can become partakers of the divine nature. Uh, here's my final point. The transfiguration matters because it's only in Christ that we can become partakers of the divine nature. I conclude with this quote from 1 Peter 1, 2, and 8. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who will call to us, who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he was granted to us his precious and very great promises, that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these things are yours and abound, they keep you from being ineffective or, or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to get back to this comment later, but I'm going to repeat myself. But these, these virtues... Uh, Supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, 
and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love, it's like stepping up a ladder. You're going, up, you're, you're going up a ladder that's taking you into the kingdom of heaven. What's at the top of that pinnacle? Love. The ultimate virtue that we're called to have as Christians is love. And you don't read about love by reading about it in books. You can read and learn, but if you don't do it, it don't matter how many books you read. And I think ultimately what happens in the transfiguration, as I'll talk about later, is it, it really is about by the grace of God, living this life of virtue that leads to all these things you want to do that you talked about. Virtue is what transfigures us. But in order to live a life of virtue, we have to get rid of, get rid of some things in our life. We can't have our cake and eat it too, in other words. That, you know, I think what it boils down to is if we seek this virtue of our Lord and seek this life, there's some stuff that's got to get put, put, put away. There's some stuff we have to repent of. And that's why we have an ascetical life we're called to live. That's why we do all kinds of things like praying, which is the critical thing, fasting and almsgiving. I kind of look at that and you have a, like, there's like three schools, or four, four, yeah, three schools. You, you have three legs, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. You take one of those legs, one of those legs away, the thing collapses. So as we contemplate the goals you're seeking, uh, at the bedrock of this, to want to have this experience and be transfigured with Christ, our lives have to be about prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, because they all work together. Prayer puts us in communion with God. Alms, fasting kind of deals with those passions in our life we don't need. So much of the Christian life is discerning what we need versus what we want. And I think that's, that's something we all have to struggle with. You can be bishops more than anybody else. What we want versus what we need. I love that account of Martha and Mary, you know, where Mary is distracted with much serving, is all worried and saying, why don't you get Mary to help me with, with, with all this stuff? And Martha was doing an honorable thing, but, but Christ says to Martha, 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 you're troubled about many things, but Mary has chosen the good part will not be taken away from her. Mary knew what she needed. And Christ was not going to take that away from her. So I think one of the things, as you look at the goals you want to accomplish in this process of transfiguration, uh, there has to be always a bedrock of this being repentance, which I'll get into in my other talks. A change of heart, a change of mind concerning how you look at your life. Um, then following that up by prayer and almsgiving. That almsgiving is the, is the expression of love. And I think this is very important because a lot of the things I've heard uh, that, that you talked about in terms of being kind, loving, and compassionate are extremely critical. And you learn more about the transfigured life by just caring for your neighbor and loving your neighbor as God wants you to. And we have the prime example, which I'll get into with our Lord, because the cross is the ultimate expression of love, you know, in which he puts aside his own wants and desires for our well-being and benefit. He dies for us men and for our salvation. And so, um, and I'll get to that too, because one of the things they talk about in Luke chapter 9 on the Transfiguration is they talk about his eventual decease in Jerusalem. So one of the, the, one of the centerpieces of the Transfiguration, when all this stuff is happening, they're all in glory, is they're talking about the cross. And... You want a transfigured life, you can't have it without the cross. And then we have to meditate on the meaning of the cross in our life. What does that mean? You know, And we have to truly see that as being truly wonderful and blessed because it's through the cross we find ourselves again. And we, we grow in Christ and we find who we're really meant to be in Christ. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude right now with this first talk and just, if you have any questions, I'll do the best I can to answer them but I'll try and share more in my other two talks. So thank you for your time, and forgive me for my inadequacies. I'm, just, I'm kind of scared about doing this, because <laughs> I've, been, I've been away from college now for a long time, so <laughs> I, I hope I'm not out of touch, but I probably am, you know. So anyways, God bless you all, and if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them.